Caleb or Derek's or Shannon's name, their names are spelled T-O-M, okay? And it'll be able to be sorted out that way, but thank you. Hey, good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. So be thankful that you're sitting down there and not standing up here where it's 450 degrees. So uh, maybe it'll help me get done a little quicker here today. How's that? Uh, I want to mention that next Sunday we have Life Challenge with us, and it's that annual rally that they do here at Riverside, and we are going to be feeding them. We're not doing a church dinner, but we are feeding them lunch with whatever of their families can come and be part of the, part of the service with us next week, and we got most things kind of under command, could use a few volunteers to help with that. And also what we're asking is if anyone can bring in a dessert. We got most everything covered, but we'd like to get donations of desserts, maybe Christmas type of desserts. And if you can bring in anything like that next Sunday, let us know. There is a sign-up sheet out on the table in the foyer, and if you can bring something in, donate something uh, for dessert next Saturday or Sunday, or if you can volunteer to help, was set up, was serving, with cleanup, uh, we would appreciate that very much. The following week, the 19th, is our Christmas service. We'll have Power of God will be here with us, and they're putting together in conjunction with some of our folks a little bit of a Christmas presentation. I'll be sharing a little bit of a message following that, but it is our Christmas service together. However, we'll also do communion that day on the 19th. Uh, However, been approached by Pastor Ernesto of City Church, and he's also pastoring a church on the east side of Flint, uh, about using our building for a Christmas Eve service at 5 o'clock on Christmas Eve. It's a lot for us to try and do this for however many people would come out, and we got to have two, three people in the sound booth and musicians and Christmas Eve, a lot of people have family stuff, but they want to use our building for a Christmas Eve service at 5 o'clock, and so you, we are all welcome, whoever would like to, can come and be part of that Christmas Eve service here at 5, um, the, the evening before Christmas. So there will be a Christmas Eve service, it's not going to be us putting it on, but I trust if you're free... You'd like to be at a Christmas Eve service, that it will be a great service, and everyone is welcome uh, welcome to attend. Seems like there's something else I was supposed to mention that I'm not thinking of, but these next couple of Sundays, we have uh, Life Challenge next week. We have um, Power of God with us on the 19th for our Christmas service, and so other things I think are probably in the bulletin and you can take a, take a look at those. So, very good. Thanks to everyone who helped us decorate a little bit. And we didn't put a tree up on the platform. I, it, it generally kind of gets in the way when there's a presentation or something, whatever they're planning. So, but thanks to everyone who helped us uh, do the decorating. It doesn't just happen magically. Uh, it takes somebody coming and taking some time and doing this, and we appreciate it. Very, very much. Well, let's turn today to Matthew chapter 1. Wendell, you seem to be in an especially good mood this morning. So who didn't get as much sleep, didn't get to bed as early last night as you normally get to bed on a Saturday night? I'm one, yeah, for sure. And hey, you know what? It's just a game, right? It's just a game, not too much to get excited about, really, but... That was not as easy as I made it look, I'm just saying. So, all right, Matthew chapter 1. We're continuing here, kind of talking about some of the Christmas names of Jesus. Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, While she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. 
As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through the prof, through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 that uh, passage that is quoted in Matthew's gospel. All right then, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. How many of you have ever heard um, of the biblical character whose name is Maher Shalel Hashbaz. Right? We hear a lot of people name biblical names. How many of you know someone named Daniel? Know someone who knows someone named Joseph? Who knows someone named David? Right? There's lots of biblical names. How many of us know someone named Maher Shalel Hashbaz? It's just as biblical of a name as the other names that I mentioned. So who offhand just knows who Maher uh, Shalel Hashbaz is? Where we find him in Scripture? Is it possible that he's one of Noah's sons? We've heard of Ham, Sheb, and Maher Shalel Hashbez, right? Is it possible he's one of the sons of Jacob, Reuben, Gad, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Naphtali, Asher, Joseph, and Maher Shabez, Shalel Hashbez? I want you to say it with me, all right? We got... Pastors and preachers come near here, here all the time, and they say, we're talking about the power of God. Say of. Right? We get, we get in it. Repeat this after me. All right. Let me walk you through it. Maher, Maher. Shalel, Shalel, Hashbaz. All right. Let's put the first two together. Maher, Shalel, Maher. Hashbez. Hashbez. All right. Ready? Maher Shalel Hashbaz. All right, we're gonna, I'm going to ask you to repeat that a few times here. Make sure you're with me. Well, Maher Shalel Hashbaz was the son of Isaiah and his wife. And the story goes like this. In 735 B.C., Ahaz, the grandson of Uzziah, was the king of Judah. It was a very tenuous time uh, for, for not just Judah, but the nations, the kingdoms around them, because Assyria, the world's first superpower, was looming, taking over everything. And some of these smaller kingdoms in the Middle East thought, if we, we can't stand up against Assyria alone, but if we join together, if we form an alliance a military alliance, maybe we got a chance. Maybe uh, Assyria will back off when it sees more than just a handful of us, but once the Black Panther and once, um, uh, who's the magic guy? Dr. Strange, thank you, Pastor Shannon. I heard that all the way from the back, okay? Um, and, and all of the Asgardians, once they all show up, but if, if there's more of us than just one individual nation, maybe they'll back off. Maybe it will intimidate them a little bit. And the kings of Samaria and the king of Israel uh, wanted to form this alliance, but Ahaz did not want any part of it. 
He did not want to form an alliance with them. And so what they decided, all of this is in Isaiah chapter 7. What they did, this is the context of Isaiah 7, 14. Uh, what they decided was, well, we'll together go against Judah and we will get rid of Ahaz and we're going to put this guy on the throne instead and then our three countries will unite together against Assyria. We're going to take this into our own hands and we're going to uh, let Assyria know that we are not to be messed with. And so they're joining together against Judah, against Ahaz. At the same time, he's got on the other side Assyria looming over him. And so it is the crisis moment of Ahaz's life and his reign. And he doesn't know what to do. He's got Assyria on one side against him, and he's got Samaria and Israel on the other side against him. But in this moment, God sends the prophet Isaiah to Ahaz. And he says to him, basically, do not be afraid. I'm so thankful that almost every time the Lord comes to us and speaks to us, one of the first thing he says is, don't be afraid. I mean, I really like that. If God comes and speaks to me and says, oh boy, you better be, you better be nervous because I am, uh, then, then we got something to be nervous about. But he always reminds us that we can trust him. That we don't have to be consumed with fear. That we don't need to be consumed with apprehension or worry. But that we can trust him. It's who he is. And he manifests himself and reveals himself throughout the centuries not only before the birth of Christ, but the centuries of the church that follows, do not be afraid. And Isaiah brings this message to Ahaz. He says, do not be afraid. God has this. You don't need to live in fear. God is going to take care of it. Trust him. Trust that God will be your defender. Trust that God is with you. And that's what this name, Emmanuel, communicates. God is with us. And Ahaz isn't so sure he wants to go down that road. Not so sure he wants to ride that train with Isaiah of trusting God in this situation. And God says to him in some exasperation through Isaiah, ask me for a sign. A sign as high as the heavens or as deep as the depths of the earth. And whatever you ask, whatever sign you ask, I will give it to you to prove to you that I am God Almighty and you can trust my word. And that I've got this situation. And Ahaz said, no, I am not going to test the Lord. But most scholars believe what Ahaz is really saying is, no, I don't really trust God and there's no sign he could give me that's going to make me do anything other than what I think is best right now. And so in some bit of exasperation, and we can pick up here in chapter 7, uh, I think that we're starting in verse 10. Later the Lord said, this message to King Ahaz, ask the Lord your God for a sign of confirmation, Ahaz. Make it as difficult as you want. How many of us could think of some difficult stuff for the Lord to do to prove that his word is true? I'd be rolling my sleeves up thinking, okay, all right, stand back. You've never seen anything like I'm going to ask of you, but the king refused. No, he said, I will not test the Lord like that. Then Isaiah said, listen well you royal family of David. Isn't it enough to exhaust human patience? Must you exhaust the patience of my God as well? All right then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. You ever said to one of your kids, you want to cry? I'll give you something to cry about. I don't see no hands going up, but okay, there's some hands. You want to, I'll give you something to cry about. All right, it's kind of what Isaiah is saying here. 
He said, all right, then the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Um, that child's name, we're told, is going to be Maher Shalel Hasbaz. But first, let's read the rest of that passage. First, and I don't know if you have all of this, all the way through 17, I guess, right? By the time this child is old enough to choose what is right and reject what is wrong, he will be eating yogurt and honey. For before the child is that old, the lands of the two kings you fear so much will both be deserted. Then the Lord will bring things on you, your nation, and your family, unlike anything since Israel broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria upon you. Um, you want a sign? Okay, you're not gonna, you don't, not going to trust me? I tell you to ask for a sign. You're not going to do it. I'll give you a sign. All right, those kings you fear on the one side, they're going to be defeated. Their land's going to be less de left desolate. And on, your, on the other side, Assyria is going to overrun you. Assyria is going to overrun Judah as well. And you are going to be paying, uh, I was going to say paying tithes. You're going to be paying tribute to the king of Assyria for the rest of your days until the Babylonians come along. Um, but we come down to chapter 8. Chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, make a large signboard, make a billboard, make a banner, and clearly write this name on it, Maher Shalel Hashbaz. I asked Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah, both known as honest men, to witness my doing this. Then I slept with my wife and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said, call him, help me. Maher Shalel Hashbaz, for before this child is old enough to say Papa or Mama, the king of Assyria will carry away both the abundance of Damascus and the riches of Samaria. Then the Lord spoke to me again and said, My care for the people of Judah is like the gently flowing waters of Shiloah, but they have rejected it. They are rejoicing over what will happen to King Rezin, uh, of Samaria and King Pekah of Israel. Therefore, the Lord will overwhelm them with a mighty flood from the Euphrates River, the king of Assyria, and all his glory. Um, if the Lord asks, tells you that you can give him a sign, say yes, Lord. All right? <laughs> say yes, Lord. But they were rejoicing over the calamity of the Samaritans and the Israelites and Assyria was going to fall upon them as well. This scripture, Isaiah 7, 14, one of our primary Christmas scriptures, was not primarily intended for shepherds and wise men 800 years later. It was primarily intended to the King Ahaz and the people of Judah in 735-ish B.C. And the child that would be born would not be born of a virgin. That word can also be translated simply as young woman. But that child's name was going to be Maher Shalel Hasbaz. You're going to be dreaming this name in your sleep. We'll probably, we might have a whole new crop of babies come up out of Riverside Tabernacle named Maher Shallow Hasbaz. Who knows? But before that child is old enough to do very much, both Samaria and Israel will be wiped out and you will feel the heavy hand of the Assyrians upon you as well. But it says you will, this name, um, Maher Shalel Hasbaz means to be swept away, to be carried off. But it says here that this son will be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. It's a comforting thought 
that Isaiah chapter 7 and 8 are followed by Isaiah chapter 9. In Isaiah chapter 9, we find another one of our big Christmas uh, collection of verses. And so let's start in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. Nevertheless, I'm so thankful for nevertheless. <laughs> that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled, but there will be a time. I love it. There will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea will be filled with glory. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest and like warriors dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. Who's ready for that? You will break the oppressor's rod just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will all be burned. They will be fuel for the fire for a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and his peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice. From the throne of his ancestor David, for all eternity, the passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. There will be a time. There is judgment that is coming, but nevertheless, there will be a time. God is with us. If you read through the rest of Isaiah chapter 8, there's a couple of times that that word is used. It's used, Emmanuel, as um, a reference to the nation of Judah. And the last statement, the last word of verse 10 is, for God is with us for God is with us to the people of Ahaz time it's a word of promise it's a word of comfort who here has ever asked the question God where are you why aren't you doing something about this how can you let this go on how did you ever let this happen it's very natural human feeling to question, to be uncertain, to have confusion. It's very natural human feeling to wonder, how can this be? If you are God and you love me and you love us, how could this happen? And in that moment of our despair, in that moment of our worry, in that moment of our burden, in that moment of unresolved stuff, he reminded them, as he reminds us, that he is Emmanuel, that he is God with us. Nevertheless, there will be a time. We have a Savior we have a deliverer. Yes. We have a life transformer. There will be a time, and the Lord of heaven's armies will accomplish this. And it was meant in the face of what they were going through, it was meant to be an encouragement to the people of to Ahaz and the people of his time. You are not abandoned, right. you are not forsaken. You have not called upon yourself some irreparable judgment. Thank God. God is with you. Yes. God is with us. As it spoke to the people of Ahaz's time, it spoke to the people of Jesus' time as well. Yes. Their religious leaders were misguided, teaching distorted things that were not the heart of God. They were focusing on 
priorities number 703 through 712 instead of priorities 1 through 7. Everything had got mixed up. They saw the failures of their ancestors all around them every time they saw a Roman soldier and knew they were at the, every time they paid taxes that were higher than they should have been paying and saw hypocrisy and saw challenge and inequity all around them. There's one who is coming who is called Emmanuel and he is God with us. They had had 400 years of prophetic silence. 400 words without, years without a fresh word of encouragement from God. But he had not gone anywhere. He is God with us. He was God with them. And it speaks to us today. How is this relevant uh, to us this morning? Um, I saw something online. Somebody making commentary on this passage. Uh, what was Ahaz's situation? with Assyria on one side and Samaria and Israel against him on the other. Uh, the crisis moment of his life, and this commentator said simply, Ahaz was toast. <laughs> he was toast. Uh, the people of that era in which Jesus was born a couple of thousand years ago, they were toast. Today, you and I are toast we can't solve this alone. We cannot fabricate some solution to our sin problem, to our sin condition. We can't create some kind of generic, uh, generic um, copy of God's original brand. Our only hope is him. And when our only hope is him, it's really, com when my only hope is him, it's very comforting to me to know that he is called Emmanuel. Yes. God is with us. We have this issue. Everything about us is stained with the, with the taint of sin. And we can't change it. We can't fix it. We can't correct it in any way. Our solutions don't work. Jesus came to a world in which the religious leaders had created their own solutions and none of them worked. In fact, they not only didn't work, it, but these people did not recognize the Son of God standing in front of them. Our solutions don't work. Ahaz was told to trust God. Ahaz determined not to trust God. By not trusting God, Ahaz made it worse. Don't be like Ahaz. Anyone beside me ever think, I know how to fix this, I know how to deal with this, and just made it worse? Um, one of, when we were dog sitting the two bumpus dogs for a week, a few weeks ago, we're trying to eat, big group of us trying to eat, and so we had the two bumpus dogs, Rob's dogs, down in the family room and had it somewhat blocked off. I mean, it's impossible to completely block them off. But one of the dogs had climbed up on the, uh, on the love seat and had his, uh, had his arms up on the kitchen floor. If you know our house, our kitchen sits above our family room. And he kind of started pulling himself up and um, lost his balance and fell from that ledge onto a little table, little round wooden table that sits beside my chair, and landed on that and busted it. Busted the table. Wasn't much concerned about the dog, but um, <laughs> wasn't much that concerned about Strider, but it busted the table. Well, it's a table, you know, that I you know, that I put my flavored water on and I put my phone on and my watch when I take it off. And, you know, it's, you get used to having something there and when it's not there and you've got to actually get up off your chair and walk somewhere else five feet to get your drink of water or whatever. You know what I'm talking about? You've got your, your stuff right there and it, it messed with the whole organization of my life 
and the order of my life But the dog was fine, Strider was okay, but my table was shattered. And um, so I tried yesterday putting it back together. Wood glue everywhere. I think wood glue, when you apply it, it expands or something. And your clothing is like a magnet to it. And I finally got it where the top was sitting on it and the broken pieces were there and finally got it and I pressed down. It was not a lot of pressure, but I pressed down and I didn't realize that one of the three legs was splintered from his fall. And when I pressed down, the whole leg came off. All I did was make it worse. The next stop um, was putting that remnants of that table in the garbage and then the next stop was trying to get glue off everything I was wearing Uh, and only one of those operations was successful you know what it's like to to try and fix something yourself and all you do is make it worse right that was Ahaz's situation our solutions to our sin issue don't work we have one hope And the one in whom we place that hope says, I am Emmanuel, I am God with you. I am so thankful for it today. He is the ultimate fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecies. Jesus is God becoming one of us. He keeps his promises. He is our Savior, our Redeemer, our Deliverer. Can I ask this today? Is Jesus God with you this morning? whether here in the building or watching online, at whatever time you're seeing this. Yeah, he's God with us. We know he is present everywhere. But are we walking in trust with him? Is he God with you today? Or are you maybe brushing off God's promise and God's presence? Uh, Speaking of presence, uh, Rhonda had been wrapping presents uh, for several days. And um, there are things I'm still learning about Rhonda after 43 and a half years of marriage. And there are things that I am learning still that she really likes. And one of the things she really likes is wrapping. She likes wrapping stuff. And I just, I sit and I watch her in amazement that she's taken such joy in wrapping And not only wrapping, but then putting some little ribbon or thing around it, and then you do that thing with the scissors that makes it curly cue. You know what I'm talking about? And um, and one at a time, hours wrapping. And I'm multitasking because I'm watching her wrap, and I'm also watching football at the same time. And so, but, you know, we're wrapping gifts this time of year, But those gifts still need to be received, don't they? We wrap gifts for someone. We try to find something that they like and show our love to them at this time of year and following Christmas traditions. But if you make it available to them and they don't open it, if they don't receive it, then all of your wrapping is of no no use. Um, Have we received Emmanuel? today? Have we invited Emmanuel into our hearts and into our lives? Are we brushing off God's promise or are we receiving this amazing gift of God's presence with us day after day? And then we know that there's going to be a time, there's going to be a time when every tear will be wiped away, when death and disease and sickness and weeping will cease. There will be a time, nevertheless. But if we receive, if you receive this promise today, God is with us. God is with us. Come on, let's stand together this morning here in the, in the sanctuary. The Lord of heaven's armies will make it happen. I'm so thankful for it. And gifts, perhaps, that you will receive, 
Some things that you're going to receive, you're going to be ecstatic over. And some things you're going to question the sanity of the person that gave you the gift. Um, one of our sons was, was talking about, he said something a few years ago around his wife's family. And her grandmother is, I would guess, it well into her 80s. This has no bearing on any of you who are in your 80s here today, okay? This is just this situation. But he said something uh, about liking the cookie monster. I think she had made some cookies or something. He had the cookie monster. He said, oh, I like the cookie monster. And so now every Christmas, he gets a gift from her that has something to do with the cookie monster. This year, it was... Um, pajama pants with the cookie monster on them. Nothing the matter with that, but be careful what you say around people. Uh, they might take it for more than what you mean it to be. Um, sometimes we get a gift and we say, oh, thank you very much. One of my aunts used to give us, my brothers and I, hunting socks. You know those big, long orange socks that you wear underneath your boots? We got hunting socks every Christmas, and we had to say, oh, Aunt May, thank you so much. We loved her. We knew that she loved us, but we had no earthly idea what to do with hunting socks. If I was in the woods, it wouldn't matter how much weaponry I had on me. If I saw a deer, I would run for my life that he would call all his dear friends and they would all be charging me, coming after me. Sometimes we receive gifts that maybe isn't something that we, that, that does much for us, but we think about the gift that God has wrapped up for us in flesh, the person of Jesus Christ. And it's to remind you and to remind me that in the face of it all, in the face of the craziness of life, all of the things we don't understand, all of the things that we just think it shouldn't be this way, he reminds us that there will be a time and that we don't need to walk one moment of one day apart from God is with us. In our minds, in our thinking again this morning, as we conclude in prayer, let's kind of unwrap this gift again. With all of the magic of Christmas, with all of the magic of the, of the wonder of it all, I was listening to some of Tommy's message in their first service this morning, was talking about Christmas at his grandparents' whether in Ohio or in New York, and the memories and the magic of it all. There's magic to it. There is wonder and awe to it that God became one of us. It was the only way that we could really see who he is and see his heart for each one of us and have in our mind what it means that God is with us. So let's unwrap that gift again this morning not because everything in our life is going perfectly not because everyone in our lives is doing great but because God became one of us that the son of God became the son of man so that the sons of men could become the sons of God he is God with us he is God with you today Let's reach out to him once again in gratitude, in awe, in amazement at his love, at his grace. Let's call upon him again today. Invite him in again today. Receive him again today. You'll never open a better present. You'll never open a better present. Some of you may be getting Mickey Mantle rookie cards like I've asked for for Christmas from my family. Some of you may have asked for receiving the same thing, $5.2 million piece of cardboard.
but it all pales in comparison to the gift of Jesus. And let's honor him this morning and honor him throughout this day. Let's honor him together and come on, let's call upon his name this morning. Father, we again today thank you for your word and we unwrap again with great anticipation and great delight, with great amazement and we continue to be surprised day after day by your majesty and your glory, by your love and by your grace. And we throw our arms open to you again today. Thank you for being our Savior. Thank you for being God with us. Thank you for being our Deliverer. And we trust you with everything. We trust you with everything. Again today, as we call upon the name of Jesus, Emmanuel, God is with us. We are not abandoned. We are not cast off. We are not dismissed or ignored. God is with us today. I pray that whoever is here in this today who may not be walking in relationship with you might unwrap that gift today. Forgive our sin, we pray. Thank you for the provision for our forgiveness in the work of Jesus Christ for us. And we place our trust in him. We know that our solutions don't work, that they only make things worse. But we place our trust in you and we thank you for hearing us, for answering our cry to you today, our cry of desperation, our cry of worship, our cry of adoration. We do adore you today. And we honor you with our lives, in our hearts, with our attitudes, in our service. We know across our congregation there are some who are dealing with COVID today. We remember them and are praying. Lord, we lift Lillian Baba up to you, 98 years old yesterday. Lord, fill her with your strength and your power today for others who are in need this morning in this season for our international students who will be traveling. We ask your anointing, your protection, your blessing for each one. May this be a season of exalting and adoring the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We thank you that God is with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's go through this season, folks, in victory. In rejoicing in Jesus, have a great day. God bless you. We love you.